The charity was established in 1990, really at the height of the last great poaching crisis when 100,000 elephants were being slaughtered a year for ivory. Conservation is ultimately about people, and so we started to support projects which had a strong human dimension. Wildlife can't stand alone. It's about the people that it shares the land with. I was looking for a charity that I could put my support to, and many, many people mentioned Tusk at the time. It's innovation, it's community-led initiatives, and so I was very, very pleased that there was an organisation like Tusk out there in the conservation field. Tusk involvement is huge amongst our schools, but not only in Lewa, but in the larger Africa. They come out and they're actually part of exactly what you're doing. So when they're talking about it, they've been out there, they've seen it, and they're involved in what exactly what is happening. Children are getting through high school, they're getting through university. Those are the future leaders of tomorrow. The benefits are so tangible, you can see what is happening on the ground. In 25 years, that house has become a potent force in conservation. And now you can look and see all the projects that are making a difference. You can never look at wildlife on its own without the prosperity of its people. It has to be totally interlinked. And does help those people to give them the resources they need to succeed in what they're trying to achieve. That's where the heart of all of Tusk lies in these communities where they can really feel the benefits from it. You know, when Charlie first came to Kenya, elephants were being killed and we were unable to stop it. Here we are now, 25 years later. It's a very different Kenya. What's amazing is this area, which used to be the, really the heart of the killing fields yeah. of the last great yeah. poaching yeah. crisis, yeah. has now come under a common conservation policy with all the communities engaged in conservation. In 2012, we lost 138 elephant poached. So far this year, we're under 25 elephant poached. And that's because communities have seen that wildlife can bring peace, can bring employment. You know, conservation is bringing everybody together to make this happen, and Tusk has been a key partner in this whole process. It's a charity that's created from a lot of passion and goodwill, and if you can bring that to an issue as big and as global and as daunting as the wildlife trade, I think it's really important there's a place for something like that in there. Tusk is nothing without its partners. The, the charity is defined by the people that we work with and the projects we work with across Africa. So we work very hard to make sure those partnerships are good and strong and long-lasting. You know, when we work with someone, we work with them for the long term, and that's the key to the success of the charity. I'd love the idea of TUS being able to push forwards in the over the next 25 years to double in size and double in work on the ground. I'm lucky I live here. I live with these animals and my children have been brought up with them. And my hope is that every child has the opportunity to at least see a rhino in the wild. It's being able to see these creatures in 25 years' time. It's like that old saying, you don't realise what you've got until it's gone. No one underestimates the size of the challenge, but I really do feel we're making a huge difference for the development and the prosperity of the African people. And if we can get this momentum going, I think more and more people will back it. We simply cannot be the generation that lets these incredible species such as elephant and rhino disappear on our watch. It seems to me we have a moral responsibility to look after the natural world because there are so many forces that are working to destroy it. So the next 25 years must be about ensuring the long-term survival of this incredible wildlife and using conservation to support the livelihoods of the people of Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, welcome to this year's Tusk American Express Conservation Lecture. As ever, my first task is to thank our title sponsors, American Express, with whom we've enjoyed a 21-year partnership in support of this popular event. It's a relationship that we are immensely proud of, and I want to thank them for their continued support. For our reception a little bit later, uh, we owe a huge debt of 
Gratitude to Painted Wolf Wines, who are also continuing to support this event with their fine wines from South Africa. And for those of you who might enjoy something a bit stronger, uh, we're very grateful to Elephant Gin for very kindly providing us with their fantastic uh, gin, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, like Painted Wolf Wines, Elephant Gin is committed to donating a proportion of their revenue in support of wildlife conservation. And we're delighted to have both their backings. Now, for those of you who've had time to gather in the bar earlier, you'll have seen that there's a usual array of goodies on sale from Tusk supporters, uh, including Inkerman, Painted Dog Conservation, and uh, Annabelle Pope, and uh, various others. So please use this opportunity to start Christmas shopping. Every year, I make no apology to use this event to see if I can entice anyone from the audience to sign up to run the London Marathon for Tusk next April. We will be delighted to hear from you, as we have a number of guaranteed places, as we do every year, uh, in that event. And I can assure you there's plenty of time to train. Now, as the video you've just seen has indicated, uh, this is our 25th anniversary year a significant milestone for us. And it's been a fantastically busy and successful year. And I'm really delighted to report that with the massive generosity of all our supporters, we are on target to invest a record amount into our programs this year. So thank you all for your support this year. Now, sadly, we're all too aware of the poaching crisis that has been unfolding across Africa in the last few years. The statistics that we trot out to the media and to everybody are truly shocking, and I won't go through them again now. But many of you, I hope, may have seen the news that our patron this week used the opportunity of President Xi Jinping's visit to accept an invitation to address a vast 100 million TV audience in China and to engage them on the issue of the illegal wildlife trade. In one of the remarks that he made, the prince poignantly commented that children born today, including his own, stand to witness the disappearance of the elephant, rhino, tiger, perhaps even the lion, by the time that they are just 25 years old. But he also rightly stated that all is not lost. We can and we must change things. We simply have no choice but to halt the illegal wildlife trade. And in this, I can tell you that there has been significant progress and political momentum since we last met here to listen to Peter Knights of Wildlaid address this audience. Most notably, last month, President Xi and President Obama jointly announced that China and the US will introduce a ban on their domestic ivory trade. We don't have the time frame yet, but this is a huge step forward. And this week, we hope and expect that President Xi and the UK government will reinforce that statement in their joint communique this week. Indeed, yesterday, one of China's largest companies announced a $1 million, donation, $1 million donation towards the ongoing cost of training wildlife rangers in, in Africa. A further sign of the times, perhaps. All this would have been unthinkable two years ago. And we clearly cannot afford to be complacent for one moment. But if there is one message that you take away this evening, please believe that if we all keep at this, it is in our power to save these iconic species. We can do it. For on the ground in Africa, I can also tell you that Tusk is continuing to have a direct and very positive impact through the many partners with whom we work, 
Indeed, last month, we allocated over a million pounds in a series of targeted grants for our projects. And as ever, our objective is to use conservation as a powerful tool to combine the benefits of wildlife protection with sustainable development and education. It's a compelling argument that successfully engages communities and allows them to realize the value of Africa's precious natural heritage. In conclusion, and turning back to this evening, I want to thank the Tusk team as well, of our, as well as our many volunteers for all their hard work this evening and indeed throughout this remarkable 25th anniversary year. And now it's my great pleasure to invite one of Tusk's most committed patrons to formally introduce our speaker this evening. Kate Silverton has long had a deep love of Africa and taken a passionate interest in conservation and the work of Tusk. Kate, we count ourselves very fortunate indeed to have your energetic support and dedication to our cause. After the Q&A, which Kate has very kindly agreed to host, I've asked Tusk's chairman, Stephen Watson, to do the honors and wrap up the evening. Oh, and one final thing, if I may. Please can I ask you all to switch off your mobile phones or at least put them on silent. Thank you very much. Kate. Thank you, Charlie, for that very kind introduction. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is actually a delight, of course, to be here tonight, especially to be able to introduce one of our most talented and committed conservationists. A conservation biologist, Dr. Amy Dickman, has committed her life's work to investigating threatened wildlife populations on human-dominated land. She has spent the past 18 years in the field to find answers as how to best resolve uh, human-wildlife conflict. She is a senior research fellow at Oxford University with over 50 published papers on big cat conservation. She's a National Geographic Explorer, uh, and as you know from Charlie, of course, um, her work was last year recognised at Tusk's Conservation Awards. Now, that was where we first met, and we bonded, and we've met many times since, bonding not just over our love of wildlife and conservation, but um, also as mums to young cubs of our own. Um, now, aside from her family, big cats, lions in particular, are Amy's main focus, and as that video there um, ably demonstrated quite graphically as you saw and from Charlie's uh, words too, Amy's work is crucial. She is part of the solution to the problems that we face. There are now just 10 large lion populations remaining worldwide. One of the most important of these is in Tanzania's Ruaha landscape. Now it's where Dr. Dickman has established her base and through her work on the Ruaha carnivore project, she and her team have developed a highly effective community-based lion conservation initiative. And that's against a backdrop of poverty, uh, tribal traditions and fears of witchcraft. And she's worked really hard to bring aboard tribes who, I say with something of an understatement, uh, were reticent about being involved. Her commitment to her work is unrivaled, extending even to her sharing a tent with a large male on her first ever night in the field. Sorry, lion, that is, I should stress. <laughs> Sorry, Amy, not that committed. Um, um, excuse me, I'll allow Amy to elaborate on that one later. Um, in this Tusk Conservation Lecture then, Dr. Dickman will tell us more about her work, her achievements, and what hopes she has for conservation efforts in the future. Now we're also, as Charlie said, going to have the opportunity post the lecture to discuss some of the wider complexities involved in maintaining dangerous big cats like lions in an ever more human-dominated world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Amy's first time speaking here at the RGS, so I know you'll give her a very warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Amy Dickman. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you, Kate. I'm hoping this is the elephant gin. That will help things go along a lot easier. So, as Kate mentioned, I'm going to be talking about our work on big cat conservation in Tanzania. We do a lot of ecological research as well, which I'm happy to chat about. But this is going to focus particularly on human large carnivore conflict. So I think it's always interesting to give a bit of a background to how I came here to be standing here today. And I've always been passionate about big cats. My mother recently found a memory box from when we were 10 years old. We'd buried in the garden and said that what we wanted to be doing at the unimaginable age of 30. I won't say whether I've reached that milestone yet or not, <laughs> but written on mine were two key things. I wanted a zebra-striped Land Rover, and I wanted to be working in the field with big cats in the Serengeti. So sadly, I haven't had the zebra-striped Land Rover yet, Mark, um, but I've made a lot more progress towards the big cats. So when I was thinking about what to do and how to develop a career in this field, my overall aim was always to join the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, Wild Crew, which is based at the University of Oxford. Because it appeared as if you literally walked in the door and someone handed you a big cat. So here is David and Andy with a lion. They've been in the news a lot recently. This is not a dead lion. No dentists were involved in the making of this presentation. Uh, David with a cheetah, Arjun with a tiger, um, Mohammed with a leopard. So this is incredible. And after doing a zoology degree, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to join Wild Crew and was handed my very own study species, the water shrew. A <laughs> little bit disappointed. This is the biggest of the shrews. This is big as a shrew goes, but still about 15,000 times smaller than a lion. So things could only get bigger, and indeed they did. Soon we reached the dizzy heights of the water vole. <laughs> things progressed, and eventually I reached that pinnacle of carnivore conservation, the badger. It has sharp teeth and everything, as it's demonstrating. But eventually, staying there and whining enough paid off, so David finally sent me out to join Dr. Laurie Marker in the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia. And I spent six amazing years out there learning about big cat conservation, but my heart was really always in trying to get to East Africa, inspired by those dreams of Serengeti as a child. So finally, I was lucky enough to meet Dr. Sarah Durant, who runs the Serengeti Cheetah Project, and she said they were looking for new people to join their team and invited me out to Serengeti. I went like a shot, and it was literally everything I would ever have dreamed of. You have a lovely breakfast in a nice luxury lodge, you drive out, your study species meets you, nice photographs. Everyone was very involved and very committed to safety in the field, particularly about hydration. This was actually my 30th birthday. This, there is a cheetah right here. That is a work photograph. But I thought my 10-year-old self would have been happy to see this on my 30th. So I signed on the dotted line, joined that team, and then Sarah said, right, you need to drive 24 hours in that direction till you hit a swamp. I was like, what? And she said, oh, yes, there are loads of people in Serengeti. We need people working in Ruaha. I'd never heard of Ruaha and rather bitterly drove off, literally as far as I could go, until I hit a river, this is the great Ruaha River, set up my tent, there were no other carnivore researchers. There was no champagne, there was no cold drinks of any kind. So I was a little bit bitter, but as Kate said, the very first night in this tent, uh, I had a massive male lion come and sleep on the tent, and in between thinking I was definitely going to die, um, it struck me that this was the place, you know, for really interacting and having conservation adventures with wild lions. And Sarah wasn't just being bitter and twisted and sending me off to the middle of nowhere. There was a reason for particularly focusing on Ruaha. And that's because it is one of the most important places left in the world for big cats. And these cats are undergoing a massive conservation crisis across the globe. So a species like the cheetah, is losing its race for, um, against extinction. It's disappeared from over 95% of its historic range. Even an animal as seemingly ubiquitous as the leopard is about to be listed for the first time as threatened by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. 
The lion is one of the most iconic species in the world, yet even this species has halved in the last 20 years, and it has gone extinct from at least 26 countries. I think most people are shocked to learn that there are now fewer wild lions left in Africa than rhinos. If we look specifically at lion decline, this map shows the light brown areas are the historic range of lions. The dark brown is the estimated range of lions in 2006. The, the estimated population then was around 35,000 lions. Just nine years later, in 2015, this is the situation. All those red areas that you see are now considered to be extinct from lions. So they are only left in those patchy orange populations. And that highlights several things, how devastating the situation is for lions, and also how important Tanzania is in particular. Tanzania is the most important place in the world for lions, and the Ruaha landscape, right in the heart, is one of the most important, the second biggest in the world after Salu, and this alone holds over a tenth of all the world's remaining lions. This is what Ruaha looks like. It is a spectacular place. I highly encourage anyone who is going to visit Tanzania to come down and visit us here. It's amazing. In addition to its amazing lion populations, it holds one of only four big cheetah populations left in East Africa, as well as the third biggest population of endangered African wild dogs left in the world. It also holds globally important populations of other threatened carnivores, like hyenas and leopards. However, it's complicated. The Ruaha landscape is vast. It covers over 50,000 square kilometers, but a key part of that landscape is village land, which runs to the south of the Unfenced National Park. And this land is key for the wildlife populations, especially during the wet season. So we have to look at conservation in Ruaha as a whole, not just within the national park itself. And on that village land live some of the poorest people left on the planet. 90% of people in this area live on less than $2 a day, and 60% live on less than a dollar a day. 45% of people are undernourished, and two-thirds have no access to any form of clean water or improved sanitation. Access to medical care and education is extremely limited, and these people have the added burden of having to live alongside some of Africa's most important large carnival uh, populations. And this inevitably leads to conflict because people here are so dependent on their livestock. So this is the kind of thing that happens. There is plenty of wild prey in this area, but carnivores tend to uh, go for uh, livestock because it's fairly easy. And that inevitably leads in turn to the killing of carnivores. So I set up the Ruaha Carnivore Project in 2009 as part of a fellowship under Wild Crew at Oxford University aiming to look at and ideally resolve this human carnival conflict. So we set up a field camp on village land. It was very important that it was right there in the heart of village land, so we understood the problems. Uh, setting up the camp took about 20 minutes. Um, there were three of us, myself and two Tanzanians. We discovered rather belatedly that there was a leopard who lived in this bush. Uh, so we negotiated a timeshare. She had the night, we had the day. It was fine as long as you didn't need to pee at night. <laughs> anyway, our main aim was to understand really what, how much of an issue was this conflict in terms of conservation, and why was it happening, and what could we do about it. In terms of how much of an issue, it was a far greater issue than we ever could have imagined. We, just in the first two years of being there, we had more than 40 large carnivores killed just around the single village where our camp was, and there are 50 households in that village. We noticed two major things in addition to the sheer numbers of carnivores being killed. We noticed first that an awful lot of the lions we were dealing with had their right front paw cut off, and we had no idea why. Secondly, a lot of the poisoned lions in particular were heavily pregnant females. And once we arrived at the carcass, we would cut them open and find three or four cubs about to be born. And this is the most significant uh, portion of the population you can take out. When we asked around about why there was such killing and who was doing it, everyone said it was the Barabaig tribe. I'd never heard of the Barabaig. They are a sister tribe to the Maasai, and they're incredibly interesting. They are pure pastoralists. 
Very like the Maasai, they wear black instead of red, but they are very hostile and very secretive to outsiders. Turns out they're quite murderous, and they like to kill outsiders quite a lot, which we didn't know when we turned up in the Barabeg village. So we tried everything in the book to engage with the Barabeg, but everyone kept saying it couldn't be done, they won't work with outsiders, and true enough, for two years, we worked trying to break in with them with every tool in the conservation handbook, and it completely failed. We were literally on the cusp of about to give up because we had heard of people being beaten up for coming and trying to talk to us at our field camp. So we thought maybe we truly can't engage with the Barabeg. And then we happened to put up a solar panel at camp to charge our laptops. Then the Barabeg came to charge their mobile phones. <laughs> we couldn't believe that this was the way in with this remote, hostile, difficult tribe was through mobile technology, but it truly was. And if I'd spent one minute thinking about it, I should have figured it out. The very last thing that any one of us would give up in the bush is our mobile phones. <laughs> and it's equally true for the Barabake. So they use them to track livestock prices. They use them to warn others of lion presence or to say about livestock or people being lost in the bush. So it's really, it was critical for them to have a charging station. It wasn't a change overnight, but they started to be able to come to the project, just look at what we were doing without fear of being beaten up, and just look at our materials and start that engagement. That led eventually to the young warriors agreeing to come and have a community meeting with us. This was an amazing day for the project. They finally came. We had our community liaison officer explain why we were there and what we were trying to do. And the core message we kept saying to them is that we are not here to cause problems for you. You have enough problems already, and we know that you kill lions. All we're trying to do is understand why you kill those lions, and is there a way you could get whatever you get from it in a more conservation-friendly way? So everyone drank lots of banana beer, everyone was very happy, and literally they left saying, right, now we are going to work together. And it was such a high point for the project. Within four days, those same warriors went out and killed seven lions. And this, I have to say, was the lowest point for the project. Our team were in tears. I remember calling up a colleague in Kenya who runs Lion Guardians and saying, I just don't know what to do. There is no way of engaging with these people. And she said, this is a test. She said, I've had to watch lions speared in front of me. They are seeing whether, they, whether your word is true and they can really trust you. So she said, you have to do nothing. So we did nothing, we waited, and sure enough, about five or six days later, they came down and they invited us to their traditional tribal meeting in the bush. No outsiders have ever been to those meetings, certainly no Westerners. And it was the start of true engagement with the Barabeg. And they said, look, we lie to everyone, but the truth is, we kill lions and other carnivores all the time. If you want to understand why we're killing them, then we can tell you. So they explained there were four main reasons for why they're killing carnivores. The first one, and the obvious simple one, is that carnivores attack their livestock. And this costs people 18% of their annual income. None of us would put up with that level of loss, especially given how poor these communities are. Secondly, there is no benefits associated with, associated with these species, particularly on village land. And these are communities desperately in need of some kind of benefits from anything but ideally linked to wildlife. Thirdly, they explained there are important cultural issues. So for instance, by killing a lion, you can get money and you can get status. So they explained that the first warrior to spear a lion, even if he isn't the one to kill it, is the one who's entitled to cut off the right front paw. They take this central claw, and they put it, they wear it as an amulet on their arm. So he's wearing one here. And they get to go to the witch doctor, and he gives them permission to go and visit all the other Barabeg households to receive gifts of cattle for his bravery. So this, the young men explained, was the only way they had of building up income and the ability to buy cattle or to get cattle and therefore to you know, get married and all those other things. And it also gives them status in the community as warriors. There are also cultural issues about man-eating. Man-eating is a big issue in southern Tanzania. Do come and visit. Um, but it's, it's really, unfortunately, a, a bit of an issue. And around Ruaha, we do have uh, several instances a year. This is a man who was attacked by a lion who happily we managed to save his life at the field camp. 
But we discovered that there were lots of myths around man-eating, and particularly each tribe tend to think, tended to think it was only happening to them. And they thought that the lions were being bewitched by rival tribes, turned into what they call spirit lions, and sent to attack people from their own tribe. So actually, this kind of conflict reflects not so much about issues with lions per se, but it reflects conflict between different tribes and a lack of communication that different tribes don't realize is actually happening to all of them. The last issue was the lack of conservation awareness. People didn't realize why anyone would care about these species, and particularly why the Ruaha landscape in particular is so important for them. So we had no idea how to deal with any of that, frankly. But, and we always laugh that we have multiple degrees and no clue how to actually do effective conservation. But we started with the only thing we did know how to do, and that was how to protect livestock enclosures. It turned out that two thirds of the attacks we deal with are in livestock enclosures, which are usually these traditional thornbush enclosures known as bomas. So in order to protect that, we had to obviously strengthen them. This is where a leopard jumped over, and frankly, I could jump over that. So it's really important that we fortify these enclosures. So we've started an initiative where we do predator proofing of the bomas. This is on a 75%, 25% cost sharing basis with the local community. So the household pays 25% to stay engaged. And we bring in very heavy duty wire and reinforce the whole enclosure. We've done over 100 so far. They are 99% effective at preventing attacks. And so far we're safeguarding over 2 million US dollars worth of livestock for an investment of about $50,000. And this is really good for safeguarding the economic security of those households. However, not all attacks happen in the Bomans. About a third happen out when livestock are grazing. So we worked with Laurie Marker again in Namibia, and we started the first trial of specialized Anatolian shepherd guarding dogs in East Africa. They look very cute, but when you give them to a farmer, they're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Have you seen a lion? They're massive. So, they do look ridiculous, but they do grow into big, impressive dogs. And also, it's very important. Pe people have been so positive about this locally. So we've only placed 10 so far, but we've shown that they can really work well, they can thrive. We've had no attacks on herds that are accompanied by these dogs, and there's a huge local demand for them now. It has also changed the attitude locally of people towards dogs. So we had a community meeting. Everyone has dogs. But we had two village camp dogs, and they were sitting bias, and they were getting in the way, so he said to them, sit in Swahili, and the dogs sat, and the whole meeting ground to a halt. And I was like, what just happened? And they said, where did you get the magic dogs? <laughs> I, said, I was like, what do you mean? They're not magic dogs, they're just normal dogs. And they said, they can speak Swahili. We want magic dogs. So... I said to the guy, Punya, who had given us the dogs from his litter, I said, Punya, they're just normal dogs. You gave us the dogs. And he said, I would never have given you those two if I knew they were magic. <laughs> so then we had endless amounts of people coming and training the dogs, and we were showing them that dogs can understand people and that they would train them with little bits of bread. And it really changes the attitudes that dogs can be useful for people. And I think the Anatolians may be a little too big, so we're now looking at crossing those with village dogs. And once we get people to engage in their own dogs and making them effective guardians, it can really be effective at reducing attacks in the bush. For community benefits, we didn't want to do that traditional thing of us assuming what the community wanted. We asked them what they most wanted, and their three top themes were what any of us would have, education, healthcare, and for them, livestock health um, and veterinary medicines. So we started initiatives for all of those themes. Um, for education, we had no money at the time. It was before we met Charlie. Um, and so we started twinning schools, local village schools, with international schools in the UK or the US. The international school has to basically commit 300 pounds a year, and the school gets whatever it most needs. So usually textbooks, pens, desks, chairs, whatever. And this has been so popular. We've done 10 so far. We really need to do about 14 more. So if anyone knows of schools that would like to twin, then please get in touch. But the real barrier to education is secondary school education. And the inability to pay for secondary school education keeps people in these poverty traps. 
So we have started what we call the Simba Scholarship Initiative, where we pay for the most promising girls and boys to go all the way through secondary school. So far, we've got 16 scholars, and again, it's something we want to expand. For healthcare, the villagers had built a healthcare clinic, and then we worked with them to equip it with everything you need to become a registered clinic. And this was just, it's such an important thing in the community. It's focused particularly on infant and maternal health, and even something as tiny as these umbilical clips, which we've got in from Medwish in Ohio, make a huge difference, because they are not using old razor blades or dirty bits of cotton to tie off the umbilical cord. It hugely cuts neonatal infections and death. So it makes such a change in the community. The next step we want here is a Land Rover ambulance, because that's the next pressing need in the community, is to get people to these clinics from their remote homesteads. For the veterinary medicines, we've provided good, high-quality veterinary medicines, but there was such demand that we decided to limit it to those people who had engaged in the BOMA predator-proofing initiative. And that was for several reasons. It incentivizes people to predator-proof their enclosures, therefore reducing conflict, and it means that then those households will not only reduce losses to carnivores, they will also reduce losses to disease, and it pays back their investment in the enclosure. Disease kills nine times as much stock as predators do, and this really, really helps secure people's economic livelihoods. But it's really important. The benefits have been great. People love the benefits. But it's very important that we link them specifically to wildlife presence, not just because the project's nice. It has to be incentivizing conservation on the ground. So we do camera trapping as part of our ecological work. These are remotely triggered cameras. And so we now have trained the villagers themselves in eight villages to go out and do the camera trapping themselves. And they get rewarded with points for every individual animal they camera trap, which they can then exchange for additional community benefits of school books or veterinary medicines or clinic equipment. So we spent a long time figuring out the point system. I had a one to five basis. They wanted 1,000 points to 5,000 points. Fine. So a dick dick is now worth 1,000 points. Uh, a baboon or a monkey is worth 1,500 points. Large herbivores, elephants and the like, 2,000 points. More if it destroys our camera trap. But they also get uh, points every individual. So this picture of an impala and a baboon gets them 2,500 points. Uh, pictures of livestock or people get no points, no matter how interesting uh, they might be. But most of the points go to large carnivores. So we do it, we reward them for keeping the more threatened species. So uh, spotted hyenas and leopards both get 3,000 points. Uh, lions and cheetahs get 4,000 points. And the wild dog gets 5,000 points. So this is the top spot. One of the villagers recently had 16 wild dogs on a camera trap, so they got 80,000 points. They were thrilled. And this is amazingly important at changing attitudes. It gives the ownership back to the communities and gives them very tangible rewards. I was in a car recently with one of the guys, and a dick dick ran across the road, and he said, a thousand points. <laughs> and I laughed and thought, God, that was amazing, because before he would have said, dinner. <laughs> so it really, and people have said to me, how do we get more points? Maybe we should get that guy to stop putting poison, or I know the snaring in that area. And we say to them, this is up to you, however you guys manage it, but it's at the village level to help conserve both carnivores, their prey, and their habitat. For reducing the cultural issues in terms of money and status, we work with the Lion Guardians Project in Kenya, and we started the first Lion Guardians Project in association with Panthera down in our site. And this basically pays people to have their traditional roles as warriors, and, but in a conservation-friendly way. So they go out, they track lions, they warn the community of lion presence, and they are paid every month as long as there is no killing, no wildlife killing in their zone. And because they're influential warriors, that means they influence the whole age set, not to put out poison, not to put out um, snares, for instance. It also gives them status, because they go to Kenya, they get trained how to use things like GPSs. And we said to them, what would give you the most status? And they said, to learn how to read or write, because only one person in the village could do it. So now we have warrior school every week, and they learn how to read or write, and now they're teaching others. The issues over man-eating and the intertribal conflict, we were completely stuck until the World Cup turned up 
And then we realized the only way of getting different tribes to talk together is through football. So we've started sponsoring village football teams just to encourage some dialogue between young men of different tribes. When we start talking to them about conservation and carnivores, helping them realize it is not an isolated problem to their tribe that somebody else's tribe is causing, it's a generic problem that we can help solve, and more so if they work together. Lastly, in terms of improving conservation awareness, uh, we do this through two main approaches. There are DVD nights, which are wildly popular. People walk miles to come and see the DVD nights. I think they want to see Mission Impossible or Avatar, but we show them living with lions, and they seem to like it. <laughs> so we've had over 20,000 people attend these. We really need to translate some of the big Disney, BBC films into Swahili and other local languages. And we also take people into the park. These people have never had the opportunity to legally visit the park and to understand about wildlife in a non-threatening environment. They only see lions when they're killing their livestock. They only see elephants when they're destroying their crops. We have to engage them, understanding about wildlife in a more positive way, and it really makes them much more empathetic towards them. We really need to build Tanzanian capacity, and that's a key focus of the project. So the, the project has grown to over 50 staff now. 95% of people are Tanzanian, and we've helped encourage two, um, sorry, 75% of our research assistance through further education. So what impact has the project had? Well, we've reduced depredation in the core study area by over 60%. And most importantly, we've reduced carnivore killing in that area by over 80%. And it's been really, really the sea change is hard to measure, but the amount of um, welcome that we get now in the community is huge. They have started penalizing each other for killing lions. And we are seeing that, so they came to us recently and gifted us the land that we have our field camp on and because they were worried that we would move and they said, we want you to stay here long term. So that is such a difference from the beginning when numerous times we thought we were going to be speared to death in the bush. So because of the work of our whole team, uh, I was lucky enough to be nominated for the Tusk Conservation Award last year. And that was amazing and has really opened up just so much for the project in terms of exposure. So I'm going to show you now the nomination video that Tusk put together. It basically tells you everything that I've told you in three minutes instead of 30. So could have saved you quite a lot of drinking time. But we'll go to this, and then we'll just come back to some final remarks. Unfortunately, I couldn't be in Africa for this filming because I just had a baby. I have a little girl, Millie, who is now three months old. So that turned my life upside down. I miss being in Africa because I think Africa really resonates with people and the wildlife, the kinds of species you have. There's some connection there that I think is hugely powerful and needs to be conserved for the future. Before Amy Dickman set up the Roaha Carnivore Project in 2009, the area had the highest documented level of lion killing in East Africa. In just a year and a half, warriors from a single village had killed 39 lions. So it was very challenging to set the project up. We knew there was a lot of conflict in the area, a lot of lion killing, particularly from this Barabeg tribe that are very secretive and very hostile. The Barabeg young men were going out and killing lions because they were getting status and wealth. But through working very closely with the warriors, with the wider community, we've been seeing a big change in attitudes to actually being penalized from killing lions. And that was done entirely within the community. Not to do with us was a huge transition from a conflict situation to a conservation situation. The Roaha landscape is incredibly important for lions in particular. It has over a tenth of all the lions left in the world. And in this area, there was the highest recorded rate of lion killing anywhere in East Africa. In the space of just five years, Amy's work has resulted in a 60% decline in livestock depredation and an 80% decline in carnival killing. We worked at all stages with them to try to make sure that the programmes made sense from a community perspective. And now it's a complete turnaround from not wanting to work with this to really wanting us to be there in the long term. I really hope that our work does empower local communities to address carnival conflict themselves. And that's been something that's been key in how we designed our programmes, that if we had to pull out at any moment, we would leave a, you know, a positive legacy there anyway. One of the ways we do it is employing and training local people in how to respond to carnival conflict and reduce it so they can share that knowledge across the wider community. And also by doing things like equipping clinics, providing scholarships, 
equipping schools with educational materials, you're leaving actual tangible benefits there that we hope set people on a road that changes attitudes, it changes behavior. This work takes a long time. It can't be done in five years. It needs to be done over generations. And we need to commit to that, to show these people that we really are behind them. I'd like to see more healthcare clinics, more educational opportunities. And I'd like to see our guys from the team go on and get their PhDs and go out and become decision makers in African conservation at a much higher level as well. I want Millie and all the other children to be able to go out there and have those same experiences and be as impassioned by it as I was. Then I think we shouldn't be the ones to take that away. By the time she is my age, will there be lions and will there be elephants and rhinos? And that's up to us, and I think that's a huge responsibility. So that's given you some idea of what we're doing at the moment, but the work isn't done. As we mentioned in that video, there is so much more that needs to be done. In Ruaha in particular, we are working intensively in five villages at the moment. There are 22 that we need to work across. That means raising our budget from the current sort of 150,000 pounds a year we work on, it's probably closer to 400,000 pounds annually. Quite a big ask, but still that will help protect the second biggest lion population in the world and impact tens of thousands of local people. We can't just look at individual sites if we want to have real impact. We need to look at all those places across Africa and start having a much more joined up approach to conservation. So with that in mind, a group of six of us who all face these same issues with lion conservation in the field, these individuals are from Kenya, Mozambique and Tanzania, have decided to join together we formed what we call the Pride Lion Conservation Alliance so that we can share successes and share failures and make sure that we are working the most efficiently we can with our resources to implement the best practice conservation across such a lot of lion remaining range. And also it's not just about even conservation biology. There's a group of us now at Oxford who have formed a geopolitical team because it is so much more than just sort of the boots on the ground conservation. We've started looking at all the big global issues to do with conservation, so poverty and corruption and conflict and human development. And we've just published the first paper, which is called Priorities for Global Felid Conservation. And this basically looks at the most important countries left for wild cats. So for instance, China and India are the two most important countries for cats left. And then we overlay that with all the potential threats to cats and other wildlife, things like corruption and poverty and war. And that shows that these dark countries here are the most effective ones for conservation. And unfortunately, that's often a sort of reverse image of the important ones. So for this to be effective, we need to expand beyond conservation biology. We need to bring in development experts and policymakers, economists, financial advisors, risk analysts. Truly, we have to make this a global effort. And I think this comes back to the whole point, and Charlie brought it up at the beginning, is that this requires everyone. Tusk, rightly, is a community-based conservation organization, and so is our project and each of their other partners. However, I think people often think that community-based conservation just means the local communities who live directly with wildlife. It doesn't and it can't. This has to be about the global community stepping up. Those people cannot bear the burden of wildlife conservation alone. So every one of us has to stand up and put whatever we can into it and by supporting projects like ours and supporting organizations like Tusk, everyone can really play such an important role. We know what to do, we know we can do it. With everyone's support, we can really ensure that we safeguard the future of Africa's iconic species for many more generations to come. Thank you very much. Amy, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to have some of your gin. Um, <laughs> huge, enormous thanks. Entertaining, engaging, and educational. Let's pick up. I'd like, we're going to go back to the ground level because it's fascinating, your journey. But just picking up on that last point, the geopolitical picture, 
in a week that we have seen His Royal Highness address the Chinese people directly, and I know you had the pleasure of his company. Actually, I'm sure if he was here, he'd say it was a pleasure of your company at the anniversary um, ball that you sat next to His Royal Highness, and I'm sure you were able, or I know you were able to feed back to him about your work in the field. How crucial is it to have figureheads uh, like His Royal Highness and diplomacy around the world, and how confident are you that it, that can make a difference? We've seen that you're making a difference, but some will say, well, that's just a drop in the ocean yeah. to what we really need. Yeah. I think it's so hugely important, and this isn't just sucking up to Prince William, although I'm happy to do that, but uh, it's so important to get those big global icons to actually step up and say, this is such an important topic for the world. You know, it's as important as anything else. Conservation, illegal trade, fuels many of our biggest issues, you know, terrorism, and it's, it's such an important aspect in many areas of life. So I think having people like Prince William stand up and speak directly to the Chinese people is absolutely critical. And those people shouldn't be vilified, I think, I mean, because I think an awful lot of it is a lack of awareness. So raising awareness and understanding of what people can do and actually making a difference as consumers. So he said to them, you, know, you can be the future leaders in safeguarding these species for many years to come. And I think that's the powerful message to get across, that that power is in those hands. I asked him at the dinner how effective did he think it would be, and he said, really, in those sorts of environments where it's quite top-down, that's great. You know, it does work very well in that situation. So I think we have confidence that by getting the leaders and the Chinese people involved, we can really deal with some of the most important topics. And you mentioned your paper just um, yeah. in, in those last few minutes. What did you find was the single biggest factor then in the decline of the lion yeah. population? So, so that was a global one. We're now looking at a lion analysis, specifically looking at which factors were linked to lion decline in countries and whether we could predict then going forward likely future declines. And people are always concerned, um, particularly about human population growth. We put in everything that we thought might be an issue, human population growth, corruption, poverty, development. Human population growth came out nowhere. It was all about corruption and governance. So if we can engage the policymakers and the governments and say to people, you can have the best laws in the world, but we need people to follow them for settlement, for poaching, for agriculture, for hunting, all those issues. And if people do that, then we can deal with this big explosion that will be in Africa, but we have to start dealing with the issues like corruption and governance right now. And what about trophy hunting? We've got to bring that up now. Everyone will obviously be all too aware of the situation yeah. with Cecil the Lion. Where do you stand on trophy hunting within that? Because obviously yeah. that is about good governance. Definitely. Whether or not you support hunting itself, exactly. there is an issue of governance there. But where, is, where do you as a conservationist stand? Well, I think you're completely right. It depends on the governance and the rule of law. Because I think badly regulated trophy hunting is undoubtedly a major conservation issue because you can take too many, particularly males, out, you have issues with cub mortality. But well-regulated trophy hunting, paradoxically, can protect massive tracts of wildlife habitat. So it's, a very, it's not this black and white issue that was portrayed in the press over the killing of Cecil. There's a huge shade of grey in the middle that we need to be thinking about how do we protect that habitat. There is more land set aside in trophy hunting areas than in national parks and it's far more economically viable in most of those places. So obviously, I, am, I imagine you yeah. would say, ideally, we wouldn't have it at all. Yeah, in a dream world, in a utopia, there would be no need for anyone to kill lions. I've seen enough lions dead, but we don't work in utopia. If we did, there wouldn't be a need for conservation. So in the current situation, I would love to not have lions killed. However, the most important thing is habitat. You, know, you can bring lions back, you can't bring habitat back. So my message is that if the global community decides, and again, it's, it's up to the countries that have these populations, but if people decide trophy hunting is unacceptable, then it is on us to decide well, how do we then help those countries maintain that habitat in a wildlife-friendly way in perpetuity. And there, it, to my knowledge, there is no current good alternative. I think we can't enter a void, because otherwise it will go to poaching, mining, settlements, and once that habitat is gone, there is no turning back. Okay, interesting. Um, let me pick up on pride now. I can't help but notice there are all females. Was that intentional? It wasn't intentional, actually. I mean, men are very welcome to join, but it was just a, <laughs> <laughs> it was a collaborative approach. And I do think that women tend to be a bit more willing to share their failures, to, to collaborate and say, this is not about me and my ego. This is about us and lion conservation. And maybe my failures can help I you. love the way this conversation's going. <laughs> so. So Dr. Dickman, to <laughs> in your experience then in the field, it, it's a serious point actually, because I've come across it as well. You mentioned ego. Mm -hmm. um, 
whether male or female, it can sometimes be, and I, you know, and I'm involved in a number of charities, Tusk is my main one, and I wouldn't include Tusk in this, but sometimes there is a tendency for charities to operate in silos or small organisations to operate in silos, and actually they become ineffective because you know, you're diluting your resources. So your yep. call, just to reiterate, from yep. what you were saying at the end, your call is for people to come... Well, let me let you put yep. in your words. No, absolutely. We discovered that we were being less effective than we could be because we were directly competing with each other. Because there were limited funds, and if I had a great new model of conservation, I'm not going to share it with a colleague because it makes them more competitive and me less so. So therefore, we were saying that, that cannot be the model. We need to share the most effective strategies across all the conservationists. We can help set the priorities, and then we trust that we can go to partners and funders and say to them, if you invest in all of us, these projects cover about a third of remaining lions. So if we say to them, you know, if you invest in this whole core together, then we can really make a difference by being the best that we can be. Interesting. So have you had any pushback from... I mean, you, I presume you've reached out to... It, it was launched last there. week in Houston, yeah. so it's not... It's very new, but there has been some doubt, I have to say, mainly Is on there? the part of men, that we can't make it work, that it may be a bit weak. Whatever, it'll be fine. <laughs> I tell them we have plenty of chocolate. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> The aim then of Pride, God, this could, this could go into a completely different debate, but I love what you're doing. The aim then of Pride is to what? What sort of time scale are you working to on this? Because I want to bring in, I would like to open the floor to some questions, yeah. but before we do, what I want to do is we have some very brilliant people here, engaged people here. Everybody here has a skill. Yeah. People always ask when, when I um, chair these debates, what can we do? We're sitting here in London. We have heard what you've said. It looks amazing. You're obviously achieving great things. What can we do as individuals? How can people yep. be helping you? Even if it's on the small scale, as you no, mentioned, definitely. with the education project. I think that's absolutely huge. When people ask that question, which they do, which is great, we just say to them, like I say, everyone can do something. Because conservation is so broad, there is genuinely a role for everyone's skill set. So uh, teachers getting their schools involved with school twinning programs or... IT people looking at our website, we need one for Pride, so that's an example of that kind of thing, or we need to develop cons uh, computer software for our camera trapping and our sightings programs. We need people to talk and write the stories of these things, because we don't have time to do it. We need photographers or anyone, literally, I can't think of a skill set that isn't valuable. We need the financial people to help us work out, you know, the sorts of documents and budgets and plans that actually speak to finance people and show that we're not airheads in the field, and also to speak to their rich colleagues and get them to donate money. Yeah. So these are all key things that people can do. And anybody that's interested tonight, then please contact Charlie. And he will be... He'll yeah, absolutely, yeah, we would love we to Because we can't forget anyone. the reason why you're here, of course, is because absolutely. of the funds that you've received from Oh, it's from amazing, Tusk. yeah, and Tusk has been so yeah. important. I think just bringing that exposure to the project. These are tiny grassroots projects in the field that no one would ever hear of. We would never get this kind of exposure. So I'm hugely grateful to Tusk and to everyone here who's contributed because... It's so important that we keep bringing up these grassroots projects and work more effectively together. And, I, and I'd love to have that message get out there as well as not to be so competitive with, yeah. with all the, the small organisations yeah. and um, to come on board, I Definitely. think, with you yeah. leading we the charge. We all have the same. We have the you, same goal. You're a great figurehead, and I salute you, as you know. Um, I'm going to open um, to the floor for questions. We've got another five minutes or so, so I can, if, uh, I can see you now, actually. So I know we've got some microphones. Would anyone like to ask Amy a question? If you could just sort of say what, you, your name and where you're from, if you're from an organisation. There's a gentleman at the back. Have we got uh, microphones? Gentleman here, and there's a gentleman at the back with a red tie. And just so we can... Is anybody down the front, just so we can line you up? Um, not for the moment. Uh, down here, thank you. So the gentleman um, here and at the back afterwards. Thank you. Um, a fascinating lecture. Uh, question, I... Um, uh, two questions, very briefly. What is your definition of success, particularly in terms of numbers? And totally separate question is, um, you operate in Tanzania, which has a lot of multinationals there, particularly in the oil and gas industry, as well as fast-growing Tanzanian companies. What's your sort of um, approach and have you had any success and talked to them for finance and funding? So the first question, just checking everyone can hear about, what is our definition of success? I think we have the ideal definition of success in that, you know, we envision a world 50 years from now where wildlife is seen as a valued resource and actually improving the lives of local communities rather than detracting from them. But right down on the ground in the nitty-gritty, the reality right now is that if we can stop the decline of lions in these key populations, that will be successful. There are huge, huge pressures against maintaining wildlife in human-dominated worlds. So we need to make sure that right now we push back against that, work out what we need to do, and bring in, as we said, all those policymakers and development people, because conservationists cannot do it alone. 
So that's one definition of success. In terms of the oil and gas and those sorts of multinationals in Tanzania, the question was whether we could bring them on board. We haven't done it very much as yet. I mean, because we live in this tiny little field site that no one knows about. So we haven't had the access really to those companies. And it's very difficult to break into anything like that. Foundations, big companies, just sort of knocking on doors. So it's always about who you know to get you through. So if do, anyone do knows you know those anybody people, in Tanzania? let us know. A few, yes. Oh, good, yeah. yeah. I've, I've figured out who you are. Get him yeah. on camera. Could you come down <laughs> Archers and we'll, and we'll exchange cards? Fantastic, thank you. A uh, gentleman at the back. So for anyone that didn't hear, why does Ra have such a problem with man-eating lions? Well, interesting, it's the whole of southern Tanzania that has a problem with man-eating lions. And people have looked at why it is. Partly, it's, I wouldn't say it's a problem with the lions, it's mainly a problem with the people in our area. We looked at who was being killed by lions, expecting it to be young people and old people, because they're the most vulnerable. It was all young men between 25 and 45. So that was because they were walking back completely legless from the pub. And lions are not stupid, so they would wait along the way and pick off people. But still, people were responding as if this is just the lion's fault or intertribal issues and things. So that was a case of engaging the communities and saying, you can really change this behavior. In some places in southern Tanzania, it seems more embedded within prides. So in the Rafiji River Basin, you've had very dedicated prides who repeatedly man-eat and will go into huts, will swim across rivers to attack people. And in those places, I think the only solution then is to probably get rid of that pride because it's a learned behavior. So that there are different issues. In Ruaha, it could be controlled through, through people acting better. That picture I showed you of, you of the person who had been attacked, he tried to take a kudu leg off a lioness who had cubs. <laughs> so, yeah, not bright. Don't get between a mum and her cubs. Yeah. Gentlemen, um, uh, just down here, the gentleman at the back, if we can get a microphone to him in a minute, and a gentleman at the back. Let's have some ladies' questions as well, please. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Okay. Hello, um, my name's Fergus, and uh, previously a filmmaker, now uh, starting a business which is specifically going to focus on, on raising money for conservation we like through, through tourism. Already. Okay, okay. <laughs> so look, um, I, I just want to ask, if I were to help get a re-narration of a film, BBC, you know, or, or one of the great Lion movies, uh, into Swahili, do, do the Barabeg speak a, a, a lingo, a dialect, which all the other Swahili, Swahili speakers would, would recognise, or is it very specific? No, they do speak, they speak Ki Barabeg is their language, but most of them speak enough Swahili that it would have an impact. And this is something I've been pushing for years, because to show these films has an impact, but to show them in a foreign language, it dilutes it. And you need to show, it also gives the impression that we don't care enough to translate it into the local languages. I keep saying to people, these films, the people who will decide whether there are lions in the future are these communities, and we need to speak to them in their language to get the messages across. So if there's any way of translating things into Swahili would be the first amazing step, I think then potentially Ma, Barabeg, maybe the other languages. We can get speakers over here to do the full narrations and things, but it's such an important part of the wider education. Have you learned much Swahili or Barabeg? Oh my God, Barabeg, my God, it's a nice, it's not even written down. I'm like, well, let's just throw that curve wall in there. <laughs> yeah. There's no Rosetta Stone for it. So Swahili medium, but it's just, it's still it's completely rubbish. Obviously you'd still need, <laughs> yes. yeah. Um, another person to have your card, thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And there was, uh, do we have some a gentleman here? Yeah. There's a there's lady the at the there. front here, yeah. and the gentleman, if we can get you a microwave. Uh, mi microwave? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> microphone, excuse me, yes. Sorry. Um, first of all, amazing presentation. The sort of innovation you guys used to solve problems was inspiring and fascinating to listen to. Um, one question I had was, given there's mobile connectivity, um, is there internet viability? And if there is, have you guys thought about reaching out to the online education subscription models who usually do gifting models like uh, Tom Shoes and Warby Parker, like you buy one, <clears throat> excuse me, you buy one set of glasses and they give a pair of glasses to a kid in an impoverished nation. The online education models, especially the subscription ones, could do exactly the same at no cost. Is that your business, by the way? Are you in that business? 
I mean technology, yeah. Okay, Kate's <laughs> just, I'm just fishing. Market. But um, I'm, I'm just, by all means answer, but I'm just yeah. kind of wondering that we, we're taking, it sounds like we've got to take some really big leaps mm -hmm. here for you from these small seeds, from those three tents. You yeah. are growing exponentially. Have you got the facilities to tap into that online community, even for starters, do you have the online? Maybe, for example, I mean, we have just mobile. We set up a camp because it had a mobile signal, which turned out to be amazing because that was the way to the Marabega. But... It's not good enough really to do stream. So for instance, we can't do Skype where we are. There is the capability at the moment, we're building our solar capacity at the camp so that we can have more reliable power. And the next step is then potentially to do something like satellite internet so that we have that reliable internet you, capability. You actually don't need a stream. You can just download the videos. It just depends on it. At the moment, it's just on these mobile dongles. It's pretty, about a megabyte is about what we can download easily. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to get the technology. Um, Donated, but that's I think the easiest. Let's have well, don't this, worry, should we'll we have this you. chat after? Would <laughs> no, you mind coming good. up as well? That'd be great because <laughs> like, we're, we're all ears. <laughs> yeah. We're learning on that. The lady with the blonde hair. Have you got the microphone now? Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to first say um, what the work you're doing is actually extraordinary. And as you were saying, it's important to raise a profile. So I'd love to talk later on with you how we can bring in uh, my relationship with actors in America to use their profile to raise your profile. And I think these days it's social media that makes a difference. But my question is, I've been for many years following the motorway project in North and North Tanzania, which went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled against it. But now there's discussion about the government itself trying to get around the Supreme Court decision. Have you heard any further about this motorway project and whether it's actually going to go forward? Okay, so the first point I got about actors in, in America and that we should get them to raise our profile, 100% behind that. But again, similarly, it's the case of just knocking on the right doors. And this is why Tusk is so key, I think, because we don't have any exposure by ourselves. We're some random place that no one's ever heard of. No one's ever heard of me, no one's ever heard of Ruaha, no one's ever heard of the Barabake. It all sounds like we're making it up. So <laughs> it's really important to go through other people who have more you know, status to go through that. We're very keen to do it. Brad Pitt's on the list. Um, <laughs> and in terms of the, the road project, for people that don't know, this is uh, yeah, across the Serengeti. They were talking about turning it to Tar Road. Uh, it, it was one of those issues where lots of people stood up against it because, of course, it would impact the Serengeti. But actually, there is already a fairly substantial gravel road there right now. And the Tanzanian government pushed against the backlash a lot by saying, it's our country, this is about development, and you're putting wildlife against development. So I haven't heard more on the progress of it. I know it was stalled in the courts, but I do think we need to, this is exactly the whole point of Tusk and its partners to say, we cannot have conservation against development because then conservation will fail. And we can't be seen as the enemies of development. We have to say, how do we work with the governments, with the development, with the local communities to make conservation the way to get those riches? So it's something I haven't heard a specific answer to that, but I do think it's an example of where we can't be at those loggerheads with people. Here, here. Um, and we're sorry, much. we've only got time, I'm terribly sorry, because we've only got time for one more question. Gentleman at the back. Oh, hello, uh, Ted Marksworthy. Um, overseas development uh, budget is one of the protected areas of government expenditure. Uh, do you feel that the conservation movement is, get, is getting its fair share of, of, of that expenditure? To be honest, I don't know all the figures of how much they're getting. I think conservation should be getting more because it can add to development and other aspects of foreign aid. So if we could do conservation in that sort of more development-friendly way, then I think it'd be, it makes sense to have a bigger part of that pie, not from a selfish perspective at all. But we've just started now looking to the government to do things like Darwin funding and starting to get into those bigger pots of money because I think it is the way to achieve multiple goals through one strategy. So for those of us in South West London with the relevant uh, MP uh, as the minister responsible, we should be writing to lobby her. Definitely, definitely. Right, will do. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. And please, I, th I have a feeling there's going to be a long queue of people, um, which I'm sure you'll be happy to have Fine. a chat with everybody, <laughs> or even just give Amy your card, or Charlie, or Stephen, any of us, frankly, if you feel that you can help with any of the projects. Thank you for your time. But ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree, she's been amazing tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy Dickman. <laughs> Oh, sorry, thank you for her. Yes, <laughs>
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Stephen Watson. I'm the chairman of TUSC, and I have two brief but very pleasurable uh, duties to perform. I mean, the first is, again, to thank the amazing Amy Dixon, uh, Dickman for delivering this truly extraordinary uh, presentation uh, to us uh, today. Amy, for an airhead in the bush, you have an extraordinary power and ability <laughs> to move. <laughs> Um, and I think for all of us here, it's really been a privilege to have you talk us through what is, after all, a hugely complex and difficult and at times dangerous and challenging uh, series of things that you wrestle with. But I think we in the charity, we're just proud to be able to have a relationship with you and in some small way to materially be able to help and support the hugely important work that you do. So, Amy, thank you so much. Um, I'd, I'd also like on, on everybody's behalf here to thank the amazing Kate Silverton for again coming and facilitating an event for us. I mean, uh, Kate, we never quite know how you do this. Your career in broadcasting, uh, your young family, but whenever we ask you to do something, you're always there for us. You're an amazing advocate and ambassador, and we thank you for that. <laughs> Um, now, as a, a trustee of the charity, and a number of my fellow trustees are here, we're, we're very mindful of one critical responsibility that we have, and that is to help the charity uh, raise money. Uh, and tonight, there are some 500 of you uh, here supporting us, which is tremendous. Um, but I need your help to raise a little bit of extra money uh, for Amy and the other projects. Now, there are a couple of ways we can do this. We could do this in a slightly unorthodox way, I could have the doors of the auditorium closed <laughs> and I could come and talk to you all individually, but that would probably detain you for a little longer than you had anticipated. Uh, the other is that we can do something remarkable and digital and a little bit groundbreaking. And, and with the help of the laser display board behind me on cue, um, now is the moment if you have brought uh, a smartphone, and uh, I'll challenge you. I'm sure there's no one in this audience who hasn't got a smartphone. You can turn it back on. And um, this is really very simple. You text Tusk15, and miraculously, you won't even know this is happening, but a small donation will wing its way to Tusk. And I'm reliably informed that if you have a work phone with you, it works really well, too. <laughs> just, just type it in twice. <laughs> and then finally, we have a, a plan B or a plan C, which is the most trusted of all fundraising devices. We have buckets at the doors, and uh, you are very welcome to try and make our buckets jingle. Um, so finally, please do that, and uh, we perhaps might let you know over drinks how much we've raised, but uh, do give it a go. Thank you so much uh, for being here. This is Tusk's 25th anniversary year, and as you've heard, uh, we've achieved a lot, and we've achieved a lot through the support uh, of our friends uh, and supporters, many of, here, uh, of you here tonight. So we'll see you same time, same place next year, for the next American Express Conservation Lecture. So thank you. Thank you.